one, one individual I want to bring to the stage here, and this has been uh, very, very exciting to be able to get to know Peter a little bit better, talk with him about his philosophies on not only business, but also life, as well as fitness and health, and how he's taking determination and grit, and he, he actually won the, uh, won the gold in the Olympics. I don't know the exact year. Which year was it? Okay, 1984. So he won the gold in the Olympics. And I'm going to invite Peter Vidmar to the stage. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thanks. Hey, it's great to be here. This will be a little departure from most of your, uh, your uh, events or conversations that we were just talking about the Olympics. And as you know, the games are most likely coming back to Salt Lake City in 2034. Uh, I'm good friends with Fraser Bullock, the CEO of the, of the effort to bring the games back to, to the games. I meet with him frequently. He's a great guy, and he's got, um, he's hoping for 2034. 2030 is the other option. The problem is, is that L.A., where I come from originally, is the host of the 2028 Summer Olympic Games. And all the marketing um, agreements are tied up until December of 2028. That would only give Salt Lake City... Uh, less than two years to secure all their marketing deals and such uh, to support the efforts for the games in 2030. So now they've got a few cities that are jumping in to try to get the games to, uh, to their cities so that that way Salt Lake City can have the games in 2034. It'll be hugely successful. Did any of you go to the games in uh, 2002? Okay, yeah, that was, I've been to 10 Olympic games. I only competed in one of them, but I worked as a journalist uh, or a spokesman for different companies at 10 different Olympic Games. And so I'm just the old short guy with the pointed chin standing up here now because I competed a long time ago. So I thought the best thing that I could do is to give you a little bit of, uh, of an introduction to me by showing you a video of the glory days. But I have to set this up for a second. Um, and before I do, so um, I, was, I was a few years ago, well, many years ago, I was up in my attic, and I, I found in the attic, a box of VHS videotapes. That's how old I am. And I pulled a tape out, and on the spine it said, Olympic Apparatus Finals. And I realized that this was the tape that my father had recorded on his video cassette recorder from the live broadcast of the 84 Olympic Games. And so I kind of got excited, and I thought, hey, I've got to show my kids this video. So my kids at the time were all home. They're all grown and, and off and got careers and all. But I bring them downstairs, and I say, hey, guys, come sit on the couch. I want to show you a video. Of what? Just of me. Doing what? I said, at the Olympics. Oh, come on, Dad. Just sit down. So I made him sit on the couch, and uh, I popped the video cassette tape in. And first thing they say is, wow, Dad, you're so old. I said, that's not, or so young. And I said, that's not why I'm showing you the tape. But, um, so I've got to set this up for you. They're coming out of commercial. This is the finals on the pommel horse. Uh, so I'm trying to go for the gold medal on the pommel horse. And... Um, we had won the team gold medal a few days earlier. It was the first time since 1904 Olympic Games. We, uh, I took the silver medal in the all-around. I lost to a great gymnast from Japan by 25 one-thousandths of a point, but who's counting? And, um, but I'd, I, I hadn't won an individual Olympic gold medal. And I, I, my coach did everything for me. And I wanted my coach to be able to say that he coached an Olympic champion. It really mattered to me to win a gold medal for him, more than anybody else and more than myself. I just wanted to win it for him. And so going into the finals in the Palm Wars, I was tied for first place with Li Ning of China. Uh, Li Ning was their greatest athlete. Uh, after the games, he, he, won, he won three gold medals at those Olympics. He went home, became a movie star in China, and founded a clothing company, Li Ning. It's the Nike of China. He's a billionaire. My wife wants to know what's wrong with me. And... Um, and very famous athlete uh, from China. So Li Ning goes up before me, and he scores a perfect 10. I'm pretty good at math. So I knew that to tie him for the gold medal, I had to score a perfect 10. So that meant that if my knee were to bend in the performance, I lose the gold medal. If I take a step on the landing, I lose a gold medal. If my legs come apart when they're not supposed to, I lose the gold medal. If, if I inhale when I'm supposed to exhale, I lose the gold medal. You get it. So I knew that in the judge's eyes, at least, it had to be perfect. And so you can imagine that as I begin the performance, I'm making sure I'm doing everything as perfectly as I can. Well, an extra, um, e extra effort requires an extra expenditure of energy. 
And so I started to feel a little bit fatigued earlier in the performance than normal. So when, when gymnasts do pommel horse at the end of the routine, it takes a lot of stomach strength, and we get that, <clears throat> that burning sensation in the stomach, kind of like when you do your last few crunches, and you always feel the burn at the end of a pommel horse routine. I started feeling the burn earlier than normal, and I thought, oh, dang, I went out too hard. And I had the, a dismount sequence where I traveled backwards across the horse. You'll see it in a second. That was kind of my trademark sequence that I did. The judges knew that that was my difficult sequence, and I thought, if I don't have enough energy, if I can't finish this routine, I'm going to fall off the horse. I'm not going to win any medal at all. Forget the gold medal. What am I going to do? I thought, well, but so if I play it safe, I can just get off this thing, and I'm, I can guarantee an Olympic medal, guaranteed. But it won't be gold. Judges will know I watered down the routine, and I won't get that perfect, maybe a 9.9, .9, which would be a great score, but not enough for the gold medal. So I have to make a decision. And this debate is raging in my mind during the performance. The debate lasted about a second, if that. It's amazing how you can process information when you're under pressure. And I remember saying this, Peter, you do what you trained. And I trained to do that harder dismount, so I went for it. Made the dismount, uh, landed it successfully. But because of all that turmoil I'd put myself through, I thought, you know, maybe it wasn't perfect. 9.9, .9, that's okay. You got a silver medal. That's good. You got a silver, an individual silver medal. Be happy. And then the score flashed, and, and then you see my reaction. And that's the moment at my home when all of my kids fell off the couch laughing and saying, Ted, wow, you look so stupid. Play it again. So <laughs> I'm going to show you the video. You're going to get a kick out of it. This is um, what you're going to see is um, uh, ABC Sports, this is a long time ago, guys. So ABC Sports had just developed, oh, don't do it yet. What am I doing? Why is this moving? Okay. ABC Sports had just uh, uh, come up with new slow motion technology. They called it super slow-mo. It's totally nothing in this day and age, but it was a big deal back then. And so you're going to get a laugh out of that. And um, yeah, and I had more hair then. So here we go. If we could turn the volume up. This gold medal, Peter. The pressure of eating at 10 going into this, this piece of apparatus, the most difficult in men's gymnastics. He's got to be clean here, and so far he is very clean. There's his square work. Again, up through a handstand. Can't hesitate or stop on this event. This is work. So far, so good. Back four down. And he traveled reverse travel on the horse, up through a handstand on his dismount. He might just do it. Super slow mo of Peter Pitmars, and during the warm ups, he seemed so tired. It was like the, the pre meat blues, kind of yawny and tired, couldn't put anything together. But watch this great extension, hips out way away from his hands. Here's his backward travels now up to the pommel, back down in a loop, spreads his feet, gets set up for some more flare work, and into his dismount. The only thing they may take off for is earlier in his routine when he hung his handstand, maybe a trace too long. Other than that, I saw no deductions. It was really a fabulous exercise. And he waits for the score. Hey, time. There it is. It is a 10. The oh, whole medal will be shared. Oh, my. My, my. The second medal for Peter Bittmar in the Olympics. The third, rather. Second individual. A gold to Lee Ning and a gold to Bittmar.
um, to to the Santa Monica Pier, and he would he would learn. Uh, I never saw my dad do gymnastics because when he was 27 years old, well before I was born, my dad contracted polio, and for the rest of his life, he had um, you know some real serious physical impairments. A leg that didn't work, had to wear a brace. He had muscles in his arms that didn't work. And so I never saw him do it, but he loved the sport. And after the 1972 Olympics in Munich, Germany, Makoto Sakamoto, who was the USA's best gymnast uh, for about 10 years, wanted to start coaching gymnastics. Put a little ad in challenges along the way. And so it's interesting that about a year ago, I was reading uh, an article in Inc. Magazine, and, it's, and it said this, and I'm going to run you through it quickly. Research finds that people with this mindset, and I'll explain it to you, are surprisingly more successful and less stressed. The research found that people who balance optimistic action with thoughtful pragmatism, they're realistic, and who imagine potential setbacks are more successful. Uh, they're, they're less stressed and uh, they're, they, they outperform their peers with this future-minded thinking. And they called this prospection in the article. Uh, it's, it's the innate human ability to think about the future and envision what's possible. That's probably what makes you want to be entrepreneurs, right? What can I do? What, what, what can I grow? What can I build? Those in, hi, in high future-minded leadership reported 34% less stress and 35% less depression uh, uh, than their peers. Future-minded leaders are to plan more and account for more contingencies, but the payoff can be significant. And I, I think this is important, accounting for contingencies. I think it's really important to learn that life doesn't always go according to plan. Um, most people have significant room for improvement. One way to improve it is to collaborate with others versus working alone or being narrowly focused. That's one of the reasons why you meet at a conference like this, why I appreciate Nathan putting this on because the interaction that you have here can have an impact on your future as you collaborate with others, as you get feedback from others, as you share insights, which you'll be doing in the next two days. But we don't exactly know how things are gonna work out. And I've learned uh, from my coach that we're gonna fail. And it's okay to fail so long as I learn from those mistakes. Yet these learning moments can sometimes be very painful experiences. I was competing once in the World Gymnastics Championships in Budapest, Tangri, about six months before those 84 Olympic Games. And going into the horizontal bar finals, I was in second place, ahead of all the, the, the Chinese and all the Russian gymnasts. There was one gymnast from Japan ahead of me. What got me into the finals was a very difficult combination of skills. It's hard to describe to you, but it's one where I, <laughs> bear with me guys, where I swing around the bar, I let go of the bar, I fly straight up over the bar, do a half turn, straddle my legs, come back down, catch the bar, I immediately let go again, do a back flip of the half turn in the pike position, come back down and, and catch the bar again. Trust me, it's hard. I made it in the preliminary round of competition. I got a great score. In the warm-up session before the finals where I'm supposed to go for the gold medal on high bar, all of a sudden I can't do this combination of skills successfully. I don't know why. I just didn't feel it. I started to worry, started to panic. I looked at my coach and I said, hey, you got to help me. I got 15 minutes till this competition starts and I can't do this skill right. What is wrong? This is my only big trick. I have to do this. So Marco says, well, let, me, let me take a look at it, Peter. Oh, just, just pike more on the swing. Um, arch more through the bottom next time. Try that instead. Um, let go of the bar a little bit later. All these wonderful, valid coaching tips. Till I got the ultimate coaching, teaching, and leadership wisdom. We've all heard it before. Maybe dished it out. We well, just do it right. And for a moment, I thought, forget it. I'm not going to do it at all. I'm going to leave it out. So what? I won't get the extra points I need, but I can still score a 9.8, which should be enough to put me on the victory stand, which was the goal in the first place. But I knew it wasn't enough to put me on top of the victory stand. See, if I left that skill out, if I scored even as high as a 9.8, I knew that might be enough for, for the bronze medal, with, with a ton of luck, the silver. But realistic, realistically, I'm not going to win the gold medal without doing that skill. Because the other guys in the finals are taking some chances, doing some really big tricks. At least one of them will be successful with his big skill, and he's going to end up on top. And as soon as I realized that, I thought, wait a second. This could be the only chance I ever have in my life to become a world champion at anything. 
and I'm going to play it safe and guarantee that I don't become one. Might as well fall off trying. So I looked at my coach, and I said, I'm going to go for it. He said, okay, let's do it. So I really focused on what I had to do. Now, the guy that was in first place blew it, made a mistake. All I have to do now is make this performance successfully. I'll become the world horizontal bar champion. Kind of a neat thing. So I chalk up my hands, signal the superior judge, and the big difficult combination of skills comes right at the beginning. I swing around the bar. I let go of the bar, flew straight up over the bar, half turned, straddled my legs, came back down, caught the bar. I immediately let go again, did that back flip with the half turn in the pike position. I came back down to catch the bar, and the bar wasn't there. <laughs> okay, look, I know that you're not gymnasts, but I think you're all educated enough about my sport to know this. You're only allowed to do one dismount in each performance. So I missed the bar, docked about 12 feet to my stomach. I hit the mat. <sighs> I got back up. Grab the bar, finish my routine, land on my real dismount, perfectly, big deal. Jumped off the podium or platform, I, I, grabbed my bag, I left the arena, and I was devastated. I blew it, I choked under pressure, I failed. I think I placed eighth in the world. It's not too bad. <clears throat> There were only eight people in the competition, so I'm walking back from the arena to the hotel. I'm all alone because nobody wanted to talk to me. And about halfway there, I stopped, and I promised myself something that basically went from here right down to here. Nobody heard this but me. It wasn't this dramatic sports moment, but I meant it when I said it to myself. I just said, never again. I will never make that mistake again. I've got to stop taking that skill for granted because I train that skill like everything else I do in gymnastics. You think about all the, all the guys and girls you see competing in my sport, uh, those that are getting ready for the games uh, next year, that um, whenever a gymnast walks into the gym to train, he or she may have over 150 separate individual skills that comprise the routines you see them performing at the games. And they have to perfect every one of those skills, not do them well. They have to perfect every one of those skills. Some of them are easy. Some are really hard. And it's easy to say sometimes, well, you know what, I don't have time to give extra focused attention to some little problem just because it needs it. Do I? I had to. So for the next six or seven months leading up to the Olympics, every day, at the end of every workout, I go back to the horizontal bar, work a little bit extra on that crazy release move that I tried to describe to you. And fortunately for me, that event, the high bar, was one of the events in which I ended up scoring a perfect 10 at the Olympic Games. So looking back, it's always easier looking back, I can say, well, gee, I'm, I'm so glad I failed. I am. It wasn't fun, but it happened. I hated the experience, but I'm glad it happened because it taught me to really focus in on those things I had to work on to really get better. Had I never made the mistake, I probably would have continued to do the same things I was doing, take that skill for granted, not train it appropriately, and then very easily, under much greater pressure, I could have fallen off high bar at the Olympic Games, and you'd have an ex-baseball player speaking to you right now or something. wouldn't be me. So instead, I blew it. And what I learned from that experience, even more important, is those little extra things that we do every day, like my going back to that high bar to work on that skill, those little extra efforts make a huge difference. They don't make a little difference. They make a huge difference. Look at any result of any Olympic competition and realize that no one wins by running twice as fast, jumping twice as far, or scoring twice as many points as the next guy or girl. Of course not. They win by fractions of a second or an inch or a point. So we take all these athletes, put them back on the track or the bike or the pool for these hours and days and weeks and months and years before the games and ask, well, for them to be the best, did they work twice as hard as the rest? And the answer, of course, is no, that's impossible. If a gymnast trains six hours every day, I don't train 12 hours a day to make sure that I win. My body'd fall apart. It's counterproductive. It doesn't work that way. But I can train six hours and 15 minutes a day. And that was a really simple theme to my training. I knew I could never work twice as hard as Mitch Gaylord or Tim Daggett, two guys that I train with every day at UCLA. Uh, all three of us together made the Olympic team. Those guys work hard. You can't work twice as hard as them. But if I set my mind to it, maybe I could, maybe I could work about that much harder, that much smarter. So I used, to have to, I used to have a goal to be the last person out of the gym, which is pretty hard to do when the rest of the team is that same stupid goal because workouts were long. But every once in a while, I could outlast those guys. I'd be in an empty gym by myself 15, 20 more minutes a day. And in the end, it made a huge difference when it really counted. Because sometimes life doesn't go according to plan, and we have to learn from our mistakes. Um, sometimes life does go according to plan. Talk about that prospection, that future-minded thinking. And um, sometimes things do go well when you plan for them to go well. 
I'll just share with you this, and we'll finish with this. So I trained with Tim Daggett. If you ever watch gymnastics on television, he's the announcer for NBC Sports. He was my, uh, he was my teammate at UCLA, my roommate, actually. My oldest son, Tim, is named after him. His oldest son is named Peter. I know it's obnoxious, but we're good friends. He's a great guy. So we used to walk in the gym every day, fired up, ready to go. Olympics are coming up. We're going to work hard. And our first event of the day on our training was almost always the floor exercise, that 40-foot by 40-foot mat that we tumble and flip around on. Now, the key to perfecting anything in my sport is the most unglamorous aspect of my sport, and it's called repetition, repetition, repetition. We do lots of routines over and over again, trying to perfect them. And we do all of our flow routines, and we're kind of huffing and puffing. I say, come on, man, got to keep going. Olympics are coming up. Yeah, Olympics are coming up. So we go to the Pommel Wars. That's our best event. I won the gold. Tim won the bronze on Pommel Wars. We do our Pommel Wars routines, repetition, over and over again. Finish all of those routines. Say, come on, man, got to keep going. Olympics are coming up. Yeah, Olympics are coming up. So we go to the rings. We do our ring routines over and over again to finish all of our ring routines. And now we're getting only halfway done because there's six events in men's gymnastics. We have three more to go. Come on, man, got to keep going. Okay, Olympics are coming up. Yeah, Olympics are coming up. So go to the vault, run on that runway, hit that board, flip up over the, over the horse, do vault after vault after vault, finish all of our vaults. Say, come on, man, got to keep going. Okay, Olympics are soon. Try to stay excited. Go to the parallel bars. Do our parallel bar routines over and over again. And then we go to the last event of the day, the horizontal bar. And guess what? We're not as excited as we were at the beginning of the day. I mean, chances are we've been in the gym now for six hours easily. And yet the last performance of the day on the horizontal bar is just as important as the first one of the day on the floor exercise. They're both worth 10 points. No more, no less. How we feel about it's irrelevant. I've got to get excited about what I do and be good at it, especially now when I don't want to. So at this point, we kind of have to put some pressure on so many times, I'd look at Tim, or he'd look at me, and we did this. I'm not kidding. We did this a lot. This is an empty gym. There's three or four of us left. I'd say, hey, Tim, why are we here? What are we doing this for, huh? What's the goal? And we identify it and say, okay, okay, I don't care how you feel. Is that still worth working for right now? Is it still worth it? And if we had a clear picture of that goal, the answer for us was always, yeah, yeah, it's still worth it. Make us focus about that much more. Okay, quickly, for those of us that are baseball fans, what would a baseball player say is worth working for under all circumstances? Aside from free agency and contract negotiating, what, what is the ultimate baseball experience, game time experience? What would it be? Doing what in the World Series? Winning how? Grand Slam when? Yeah, we all know what it is, right? It's the final game of the series, tied at three games apiece, bottom of the ninth inning, down by three runs, bases are loaded, two outs, full count, and then. You knock that ball out of the park. That, to me, is the ultimate baseball experience, unless you're the pitcher. <laughs> but anyways, you take any baseball player from age three to 53, and if with some sort of a magic wand, you could promise him that experience. Bing, that's going to happen to you, but only if you really work hard right now. Will he really work hard right now? Well, of course. You know, it's absurd. It's ridiculous to think you could ever promise someone something like that, because you can't. But if you could, wouldn't they figure out a way to get the job done, no matter how they felt? Well, here it is. At the end of the day, you know, I'm tired. My ankles are swollen. I tore three more blisters in my hand. My shoulder hurts. I feel sorry for myself. Gymnastics stopped being fun two hours ago. I want to go home. At this point, many times, Tim and I would convince ourselves that we could have happened to us the ultimate gymnastics experience. Whether it's realistic or not doesn't matter. We convince ourselves it is for that moment and say, what if? So I look at Tim and say this. Once again, did this a lot. I say, hey, Tim, I don't care how you feel, man. Let's just put, let's put some pressure on. Okay, let's just imagine right now it's the Olympics. It's the men's team finals. The U.S. team's on their last event of the night. Just happens to be the horizontal bar, because that's what we're working at the time. Let's just imagine that the last two guys that just happened to be Tim Daggett and Peter Vidmar. We, have, we haven't even made the team yet. So what? And here's the catch. This is, where he's, this is where we laugh. We thought it was funny. Tim, let's just imagine that we are neck and neck with the People's Republic of China, the reigning world champions, and we have to perform our routines right now perfectly to win the Olympic team gold medal. And we'd say, yeah, right. We're never going to be neck and neck with those guys. They were first in the world six months earlier in Budapest, where I had my unplanned departure from the horizontal bar I told you about. We were fourth as a team. We didn't win a medal. Not going to happen. What if? Would we be nervous? Would we be excited? Yeah. 
So I'd walk over, chalk up my hands, and in this empty gym, I could close my eyes and vividly imagine that I was in the Olympic arena. 15,000 people there, 2 billion watching me live on television. I have one chance to make this performance successfully or we're going to lose. My heart starts to pound. I'm not tired anymore. Tim's over in the corner of the gym, and he would say something like this. Next up, from the United States, Peter Vidmar. Just like the loudspeaker, I'd imagine my name is called and get ready to go. Now, you don't perform when you feel like it in my sport. You go only when the judge allows you to perform. That's when, at his discretion, he pushes a button that makes the green light go on, and the guy raises his hand. And the longer you wait for the green light to go on, the more nervous you're going to get. Tim's over in the corner of the gym in charge of this imaginary green light. And after a long time of waiting and saying and doing nothing, trying to throw me off guard, finally he just shot out, green light, because he never really had a green light in the gym, he just had to imagine it. <clears throat> I'd imagine the green light goes on, look at my coach, imagine my coach is the Olympic superior judge, he would raise his hand, I'd raise my hand right back, turn, face that bar, grab that bar, and begin my routine. Now, if I fell off the bar there, if I made a mistake there, that ruined my day. I was miserable. Why? Because they placed importance in what I was doing. I didn't say, which I easily could have said at the end of a long, tiring day, I didn't say, so what, Peter, you fell off the high bar. Who cares? It's a workout. No one's watching. Big deal. It's just another day. Just go home. Go home. Just work hard tomorrow. Just work twice as hard tomorrow. It doesn't matter. No, it mattered. Felt like I lost the whole competition. Felt like somebody from NBC Sports is going to walk up to me and say, well, Peter, you just lost the Olympic Games for your whole country. How do you feel? I'm going to Disneyland. But if I made my routine successfully, I felt fantastic. I'd land my dismount, get all fired up. Yes, I'd drive home every day after a workout like that and say, wow, man, I just won the Olympics. That was awesome. I'm going to do it again tomorrow. Got me excited. We did that for practice because we knew realistically it's not going to happen, but it's good practice. It taught us to focus, to be diligent at something when, when we didn't feel like it. Most important time to put forth effort. That's something we learn the most about ourselves. Well, the funny thing happened on July 31st, 1984, and I'll finish with this. It was the Olympic Games. It was the men's gymnastics team finals. The U.S. team was on their last event of the night. Just happened to be the horizontal bar. The last two guys up just happened to be Tim Daggett and Peter Vedmar, and here's the catch, and all of a sudden we weren't laughing because it really wasn't funny anymore. We were neck and neck with the People's Republic of China, the reigning world champions, and we had to perform our routines perfectly to win the Olympic team gold medal. Well... It's different now, but when I competed, there were six gymnasts per team. Uh, only five scores count on each event. So if one guy makes a mistake, that's okay. You throw out the low score, you count the five best scores. Follow me? Wouldn't that be great in accounting? <laughs> our first guy up, Scott Johnson, was the unheralded hero of our team as our leadoff man got us off to a great start by getting great scores at the beginning from which the rest of the team's scores can build. But after a phenomenal Olympic game, Scott's, Scott lets go of the high bar for his last skill of the Olympics, his high bar dismount, triple back flip. One, two, and on the third flip, he opened up too soon, stumbled forward, touched his hands and knees in the ground, made a mistake, and we thought, oh, no, chances are next five routines have to count. No more buffer. Next guy goes up, Jim Hartung, Scott's teammate from the University of Nebraska, backbone of our team, this guy just doesn't make mistakes. Under all this pressure, he does a great job, great routine. Lance's dismount, jumps off the podium or platform. Everything's raised up on a platform at the games. Runs around the platform. Jim heads straight over to me. I have no idea why he singled me out, but he runs over to me. He's huffing and puffing. He's shouting above the crowd noise, taking off those leather hand guards. He says, hey, Pete, don't worry about it, man. It's not that bad out there, okay? Just, just relax. Just enjoy yourself. Just, just have a good time. <clears throat> Yeah, he was happy because he was done. <laughs> Olympics were over for Jim. He scored a 9.8. Bart Connor goes up next, six months after having surgery to repair a, a ruptured bicep tendon and having 40 bone chips taken out of his elbow. Bart scores a 9.9, .9 and four days later wins the gold medal on parallel bars. Amazing. Um, Mitch Gaylor goes up after, um, after Bart. There's a crazy skill he invented called the Gaylor flip, catches the bar, 9.95. Tim Daggett goes up after Mitch. A couple of skills he invented. His dismount was a double layout with a full twist um, on the second flip, which basically means that you don't see the ground until it hits you. He lands perfectly, and he scores. Perfect 10. And it was my turn. 
I told you five out of six course count, didn't I? How many guys just performed? Five. Well, let's just take a peek at the first five scores and add them up, including Scott's routine with that little mistake. Add them all up. Guess what? We just won the Olympic team gold medal. Forget me. We just won the gold medal. See, Scott's mistake wasn't really that bad. The other four scores were so high, they helped to offset Scott's mistake. Add them all up. That meant that even if the last two guys from China, Li Ning and Tong Fei, their two best guys, if they score perfect tens in their last event, the floor exercise, it's not going to be good enough. So with Tim's perfect ten, we had just secured the USA's first Olympic team gymnastics gold medal, male or female, since the 1904 Olympic Games in St. Louis. That's when wooden club juggling, shot put, and long jump were three of the gymnastics events. And I'm not kidding. You can look it up. It's, it's changed since then. But because it's locked up, this means that Peter Vidmar can fall off the high bar 58 times. We're still going to win the gold medal. And all of my teammates behind me, below the podium, all of them are done and happy, celebrating. But none of them, none of the coaches, and no other human being told me that we had just won. <sighs> so I walk up there still thinking, oh, this is it, Pete, you don't make this, we're going to lose. Now let me paint the picture for you. The crowd's training wildly. Tim did a phenomenal job. They haven't given him his score yet. I can't go till he gets a score and I get the green light. So I'm pacing back and forth thinking, oh, I've got to make this routine. Oh, what are they so excited about? All of a sudden, Tim scores a 10, and the crowd goes nuts. I look at Tim's perfect 10, and I said, yay, Tim. And then the green light went on. Right before the green light goes on, I look at my coach, Makoto Sakamoto, a guy I've been in the gym with for 12 years. We train four to six hours a day, six days a week. Um, my last 10 years training with my coach, aside from taking Sundays off, I think I maybe took another maybe another 10 days off total in 10 years. I had Christmas day off every year. Actually, no, my coach gave me three days off for a honeymoon. He's a great guy, but he really is a great guy. He made tremendous personal sacrifices for me, and it's really too bad the coaches don't get medals too because they deserve them. He's there on the floor as the USA assistant coach. He looks up at me and he gives me a smile. I look down and give him a smile right back. And then he says one thing. They went from here right down to here. He said, Okay, Pete, let's go, all right? You know what to do. You've done this a thousand times, just like the end of every day, back at the gym. Let's just do this one more time, and let's go home. You're ready. That's right. I'm prepared. I didn't wait till it was too late to figure out how to handle a situation like this. I did this every day at the, at the end of every workout. So all of a sudden, instead of, instead of standing in this Olympic arena with the 15,000 people there and the two billion on television, in my mind, I put myself where? Back at that UCLA gym at the end of a day with maybe three people left in the gym. And in my mind, when I raised my head, it signaled the Olympic superior judge, Mr. Karl Heinz Schalke of East Germany, always a real friendly face. In my mind, I'm signaling my coach just like I used to signal him every day at the end of every workout. I turned, faced that bar, grabbed that bar, and began my routine. Finished it not quite as easily as I'd like to describe it to you, but I scored a 9.95. That's when we knew for sure, of course, that we'd won the gold medal. Got up on the victory stand for a, um, a very emotional medal ceremony. Uh, I, I, I mentioned at the beginning that I went on to win another, another silver and the all-around gold on the, on the pommel horse. But those individual medals pale in comparison to the emotions I felt up there with my teammates. These are five other guys I live a dream with. I was just with two of them, with Mitch... Uh, with Mitch and with Bart Connor at the International Hall of Fame induction ceremony two weekends ago because Mitch was inducted um, and uh, Bart and I were inducted a little while ago and it was a great little mini reunion for us. Um, we won for a lot of reasons. Um, we learned, most importantly, uh, that practice makes perfect. No, practice makes permanent. And what you practice over and over becomes permanent behavior. So practice correctly. Try to do things right every time. Don't just go through the motions. Um, and when the going get tough, gets tough, we have to stop and ask ourselves, why are we here? What are we doing this for? What's the goal? Identify the goal and ask, is it still worth working for even now when I don't feel like working? Everybody works hard when they feel like it. Everybody on this planet does. The best work hard when they don't feel like doing it. And that's the only way that we can separate ourselves, is to put forth the effort when we don't want to do that. And I learned to do that with, with five other great guys. So I appreciate 
Kicking off this little meeting uh, this evening, I, I thank you for your time. I, I wish you the best. I'm sure our paths will cross uh, in other areas. Some of you I've met before at, at different events and different meetings. I want to thank Nathan for the invitation to be here, and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much.